Our next storyteller uh, was, is, was, is the son of former Detroit uh, Mayor uh, Jerome P. Cavanaugh, who served uh, from 62 to 70. And uh, he has a beautiful, beautiful, moving story to tell. And it gives me great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to bring to the stage Representative Phil Cavanaugh. So Satori has told me over and over as we rehearsed, I'm gonna be great, I'm gonna be great, but she didn't tell me about Mark Sweetman. And I, <laughs> during break, I said to him, you know, what do you do for a living? He's a comedian. Did, <laughs> did I need to ask? And then the Meltones, I mean, that's a perfect setup, I guess, for my story. Um, this starts at Thanksgiving, 1979. I was uh, 18 years old. I. I was a freshman in college, and I went to Aquinas College. Um, and I went, drove back from Grand Rapids to have dinner at my dad's house in Ann Arbor. Uh, and yes, my father was Jerome P. Cavanaugh. I mean, and 1962, uh, it, well, he got elected in 1961, I was three months old. And my whole early childhood was living under this aura that your dad was mayor. Um, and so it, I actually, you know, went to Aquinas College, Grand Rapids, drove back, and on Thanksgiving 1979, th uh, holidays, uh, dinners, were a big deal, because my parents were divorced and uh, I was raised by my mom. They had eight kids, four raised by my dad, four by my mom. And so coming back for a big Thanksgiving dinner was a big deal, but I was a kid. Kids were seen and not heard back then. Uh, I had always been a kid, and I remember coming back to my dad's and uh, the dinner table, all ornate, have the best china, etc. and he had name plaques on each place setting, and I was actually not at the kiddies table. I was sitting right at the right hand of my father, and there was a wine glass in front of my placement, and I thought, this is peculiar, and we got there early, and I was always the one to uh, help my dad, you know, do a dish here or stir the sauce or whatever. My dad loved to cook, and it was my only time to, to really be with him because my older brothers always had dish duty, and I didn't want that. I liked <laughs> cooking with my dad. Uh, and I went in, and he says, no, you're, you're old enough. And he says, uh, I really respect you, my father said. I'm like... Why? Uh, he wanted me to go to University of Michigan. He actually lived in Ann Arbor, moved out of Detroit, because he was a professor at U of M. And I had decent grades coming out of high school, and I got accepted to U of M and Michigan State, Aquinas College. And I chose Aquinas College, and I told him, and I, because it's a, a Catholic school and it's small, 1,200 people, it really was just to get away from my parents. You know? <laughs> I didn't need to be under my dad's tutelage, uh, and I. So when he said, you know, I respect you, um, it was all because I stuck up for the, the decision that, you know, I, I had made to go to college. Uh, and I thought that was pretty cool. Um, the, we had a great evening. Thanksgiving, uh, the meals were always so extravagant and full, and, you know, I have seven siblings, so there's eight kids, and my dad's second wife, and we had the parish priests and a few other people always. There was 14, 16 people. And my dad would always sit at the, the head of the table and sort of, to me, larger than life, pontificate. And uh, President Reagan had, well, Reagan had just been elected. Carter had lost, the Iranian crisis, you know, and everybody would ask my dad about politics. And all I remember is this guy sitting at the end uh, giving his opinion, and I'm like, wow, you know, he must be brilliant or something. Uh, <laughs> and my dad had just won the, I think, the biggest case of his life and just gotten that retainer, so we were celebrating that. We went through a case of Don Perignon that night, and uh, I tipped a few. Uh, I was only 18 years old, um, but I remember after the meal, uh, I was going back to my mom's house. She lived in Milford, Michigan. 
And uh, my older brother was driving us, and my dad loaded up, and I remember the, my father cupping a cigarette and looking over his shoulder to make sure his step wipe. And I'm like, this is kind of peculiar because I smoke, and I don't want my dad to know, but come on, he's 51 years old. <laughs> um, which gets to the point that in 1974, he had had open heart surgery, triple bypass. And in 1974, your life expectancy was five years, which makes it 1979. Nobody told me that. Uh, so I went back to school. Um, it was five days later, and I was at work. I was a cook, short order cook at Big Boy. Uh, and I'm actually flipping burgers, having, you know, not a care in the world. And the phone rings. My manager, who had only known me for about a month, comes back and says, there's something going on at home. You need to go home. So uh, I drove. And actually on the radio, I hear former mayor Jerome P. Kavanaugh died. And I'm like, no, this can't be possible. It can't be possible. And I get home, and I remember vividly uh, my mom up in her room. And us kids, which was only my older sister, younger sister, and uh, younger brother, because the four that were raised by my mom, watching Bill Bonds on TV. And Bill Bonds is literally weeping on the 11 o'clock news as they give a chronology of his life. And I remember running upstairs and saying to my mom in a real commanding way, don't you ever die. This is too painful. And... You know, right when my father said he respected me and I sat at the big boys' table, uh, it just seemed pulled out because my dad was larger than life. He had spent his, you know, my 18 years from the time I was zero to 18 seeing everybody else. Um, even today, I'm out visiting people and people remember, oh, your dad was mayor and they beam. Um, I never knew that. I never knew my dad as that because he was always out politicking. I don't have a single memory of him being home for dinner but for these holiday meals. Uh, and so, you know, it was painful, but I, I went back to college and I ran for uh, president of the student body. And I was the first freshman ever elected and I said, my dad will be proud. Well, you're given all the student activity money, which means I can throw the parties. <laughs> I can have the kegs, I can do the bands, I became the most popular guy. Uh, and 125000 in 1979 for student activities. You could throw some parties. <laughs> um, but it was just a way of masking my alcoholism. Uh, you know, I had been offered my first drink when I was a teenager by my older brother, but it didn't stick. But after my dad died, I don't think there was a day that went by that I didn't drink. And through college, it was normal. Uh, after college, I went to work for a beer and wine distributor. <laughs> so I'd always drive around with a case of wine, and I'd always be the guy at the party. Hey, have you ever tried this vintage? Well, it's just another reason to drink. Uh, and life was, you know, I was, at the time, I just thought it was a good party. But I, I was just drowned in my sorrows. I did not know how to cope with my father's death. Uh, he was this grandiose figure, and... I always lived in his shadow, and I was confused. I was going through college. I didn't know what I wanted to do or be, um, but I muddled through it. After college, I went to, to work for the beer and wine distributor, and then my family started recognizing, especially my mother. She was a counselor out at Brighton Hospital, and she said, Phil, you know, you need to get a handle on this. And I said, no, no, I'm fine. And again, my answer was to move to California. You know, get out from under her, her vision. And so San Diego, California, 1995, I, or 85, I moved out there, May. And uh, I had sort of resolved myself that there was nothing I could do about this. Um, I got involved in drugs and alcohol, and it just became a big party. I lived at the beach. Uh, it, it was fun. I was the popular guy. I worked when I had to. Um, but to me, it was, I had no purpose. Uh, I swore that I wasn't going to have kids because I didn't want them to have the pain. And I really didn't have a career or anything else, but it didn't matter. I said, I will just die when I die, and I'll have a good time doing it. Uh, and a woman I was seeing came home one day in 1990, and she said, you know, I'm pregnant. What should I do? And I said, I don't know. I think it'd be cool to be a dad, but I don't know. She had three kids at the time, so I just 
thought she'd handle it. She had the normal course. Uh, and I literally, I would show up about once a week and sleep for a day and then play Mr. Dad and out again I would go. Um, and she tolerated that. So I wasn't sure if she was going to have the kids or not, and uh, she did. And they happened to be twins. And in September, September 11th, 1990, uh, she had twin girls. And I just kind of, I actually was throwing my own party at my own apartment. I lived in a garage at the time. <laughs> I had a bunch of people over the garage. And uh, she says, you know, I'm... I, I'm in contractions, and I said, no, this, this can't be possible. You're, you're not due for six weeks. You're just trying to bust up my party. <laughs> we went and uh, had a C-section. I was there, it was kind of graphic. <laughs> um, and I ran home and I told her three kids, and I remember them sleep and saying, that's nice, and rolling right back over. Uh, in, I was try, trying to figure out what the names would be, etc. cetera. Um, and I remember going back to the hospital the next morning and a nurse said, would you like to hold these kids? And the, the two girls were four pounds and three pounds, 11 ounces. So they were literally about this big. And I held them both in my forearm. And they're both there and that was an epiphany to me. It, it truly was. I look and I say, there is something greater in this world than myself. I now have a responsibility to these girls. Uh, and it was slow going, but you know, I, I decided to quit drinking and taking drugs. And my mom says, well, have you gone into treatment? And I said, no, no, but I got this, mom, I got this. And uh, I said, I can't afford it anyways. I gotta take care of these kids. A check arrived the very next day to get me in treatment and I went and it was subsidized by the government. Uh, and I came out, and I was lucky enough to come back to that family environment. Um, because it's the only thing that kept me sober. Because the only people I knew in San Diego were my party friends. And if I, if I just didn't go to work and come home, uh, I know I would have slipped. But the joy of just hanging out with these kids was cool. Well, Lily then became pregnant again, because I had moved in. <laughs> and uh, had another daughter two months, 10 months later. So actually, I have Irish triplets. Two months out of the year, they're all the same age. And when Satora said, does anyone in the house have a birthday? The first person to raise their hand, her birthday's 10 days away, and it's Mary, my youngest, but she loves being the same age as her older sisters. <laughs> uh, that was 1990, Mary was born in 91, and I worked a $10 an hour job and just came home and loved the family life. I suddenly was father of six almost overnight. Um, and it was a struggle. I mean, we didn't have a lot of money, and thank God for government. I mean, they subsidized Lily. They helped uh, with the birth of my kids. The hospital bill must have been astronomical because they were there. The twins were there for a good six weeks in the hospital. Um, and in 1995, I said, I need to make more money. <laughs> um, these girls are going to be expensive, and I really do want to put them through college. I mean, that was a goal. My dad died two months into my college education. And it's not just losing my father, but just the advice and everything else. I said, I want to be around. So I was living in California. My other seven siblings were living in Detroit. And I said, all right, I'll move to Detroit. Lily, you stay here with the six kids and I'll send my check back. And I, I went to University of Detroit Mercy, which was my dad's alma mater, although I have three brothers that went to DCL. I bucked the system. I think it's, I wanted to make daddy proud thing. Um, and I, I kept saying that uh, I'll send it back. And so in May of 1995, almost 10 years to the date, I moved back to Michigan, moved in with my brother. I didn't make it two months that I couldn't live without those girls. And I said, Lily, move all six kids here. And again, I had a $10 an hour job. I was starting law school. I had no certainty whether I could make it to law school because I had spent over a decade frying my brain. Um, and 
She moved out and just miracles happened. Miracles happened. I actually got my college or my law school loans at the exact same time I was closing a house, at the exact same time she uh, found a job. So everything worked and we all moved into one house and I actually made it through law school. At 35 years old, when all your classmates are 22 and their daddy's putting them through, it's kind of tough, but there was a certain urgency to it. I had to get on with life. I had to take care of these girls, take care of myself, and I had lost too much time. Um, I, I regretted the time I lost. Uh, and, and so I made it, I got my MBA and JD in three and a half years while working full time and managing six kids because Lily really did most of it. Um, But I kept promising my three daughters, since I had bonded so closely for the first five years of their life, and then the next three or four years, I'll be back. Trust me, you're going to get your dad back. It was law school, work, everything else. Uh, and then I clerked for a federal judge. And again, that's 80 hours a week plus finishing school. You'll get your daddy back, I promise. So I left the judgeship. Uh, it was a two-year gig from 98 to 2000. In 2000, I'm looking around. I'm saying, I got this law degree. I, you know, what am I going to do? But my principal goal was to be their father. And seriously, I thought, I'm going to hang my own shingle. And I said, no, to, to develop your own law practice takes too much time. I said, okay, uh, I could go work for a firm. Again, your billable hours and you're working too much time. So I look around, I have two brothers that are on the Wayne County Commission. And I said, I can do that job. <laughs> It's a good little salary. It's part time. Um, and so I ran for election and won in 2000, uh, took office 010101. And their daughters got their father back. I joined the PTA. Uh, I was at every fundraiser. I went on every holiday trip because the commission, you know, you had certain meetings and the rest of the work you, you did on your own. Uh, in, it, it was fabulous, but it was just a job. And then I was appointed to the Detroit Wayne County Mental Health Agency. And I was a board member there. And I go over and I see the political infighting between the mayor and the county exec. And this money, and it, at the time it was $540 million. And there's six appointees by the mayor and six appointees by the county executive. And they just kept fighting over this money. Well, whenever you have big money in politics, you have campaign donations and controlling the vendors and that kind of stuff. But a, a light bulb, a second light bulb, first one was the day after they were born, went off and I, I realized the people that government can help, these are the mentally ill, these are people that you know uh, are, are working in AFC homes and being paid minimum wage and a slow pay by government means they don't pay their rent and they're trying to explain to their landlord. Or, you know, somebody running a, uh, an agency or a provider and suddenly um, they, they can't take care of their people, etc. Uh, and it really had an impact on me that there's a bigger goal to, to government. That it's, it, if run properly, you can really make an impact on people's lives. And so I, I was a county commissioner. I am now a state representative. I serve on the Governor's Commission on Mental Health and Wellness. Um, I'm really proud of some of the work we've done over the year and a half. Just last week, we appropriated almost 15 million for projects specifically to try to enhance uh, mental illness, um, reduce the stigma, and get early assessment and early treatment. I'm a firm believer in juvenile justice. A dollar spent in prevention saves, saves seven in, in incarceration. And when government figures that out, that investing in our youth is gonna save money in the long run, and I'm, I'm not here to try to pontificate, it's just, I, I, I realize the balance. I could be a father, and I could be a government official. And I'm not sure my dad ever realized that. He had to be one thing, and it was the politician. And I was this scared child looking up to him that he always demanded respect. And I don't mean to come down on my dad. People loved him and he's well respected, but it was also the era, you know, in the 50s and 60s, you drank, you smoked, and you socialized. And again, kids were seen, not heard. 
Um, and it's all good, but I, I just want to stand here now and say, my three daughters saved my life. And I told them, them that nearly every day when they were young and every week and every month, because they truly did. And they raised me. Um, I you know, split from their mom and I actually raised the three girls and it was my greatest accomplishment. And my twins graduated from University of Michigan. And the big house is my screensaver on my phone because that is something that I was able to do that my dad didn't. And to me, it's just all about balance. I mean, life is hard. And I, I take all that perspective to my job now. But it's my, my daughters, the family is the core for our existence. And I want to thank my father for teaching me that, even though he doesn't, he doesn't know that he did. He has seven grandchildren that he never saw. And through my recovery and sobriety, I plan on seeing their grandkids. And I am a virgin at this. And they keep pointing to my daughters. I don't want to go there, I don't want to know. <laughs> But I do want to thank my daughters for saving my life and thank my father for teaching me that lesson. And if I could take the due diligence, they're all in the front row. Thank you for your time. Bill Kavanaugh, Representative Bill Kavanaugh.